Our first speaker will be uh, Xin Hui, I hope I pronounced that correctly. She will be talking about speeding up your data processing using parallel and asynchronous programming in data science. Jin, can you please can you please um, unmute and then start sharing your screen? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Hello everyone. I hope everyone had your lunch, coffee, dinner, or whatever. Yeah, any uh, basically you all filled up. Uh. So okay, um today I'll be talking about how to speed up your data processing using parallel and asynchronous programming. And in this is in the context of data science. So a little bit about me. I am Jin Hui and I am a data engineer at ST Engineering. So yeah, I am in so I am part of a data science a relatively small data science team which works on like interesting data science problems in engineering. Um, my background is in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. And in my in the task of in the course of my work, I use pandas pretty much every day during working hours. And that's why I contribute to the documentation for Pandas 1.0 release. So if you look at the documentation for Pandas, you might see something that I contributed to. And, um, I, uh, and in my free time, I, before this whole epidemic, I volunteer as a mentor at Big Data X, a, a community-driven community, a community which organizes like, data engineering workshops for the people of all types of skills and backgrounds. Yeah, so that's a bit about me and that's why I have a, that's why I have skin in the game for this slide, this presentation. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I work in a, red, a small scale data science team. So this is what a typical data science workflow looks like. First, we have to extract the raw data from the data source and so we will be getting it from the business, like some client, like some business problem. It could be like some form of like CSV or like some database, or it could be an API. So that's, so that's where we extract the raw data. Second step is that we have to process the data. So we massage the data. We do the processing that is required to train our model, which is a third step. Third step is whereby we fit the model, we fit the data, into the model and train the model. And then lastly, we will evaluate the model, the performance of the model. And if it looks fine, it looks great. That's where we deploy the model into production. So it looks pretty straightforward, right? It's like this very nice pipeline. But when you're dealing, like, when you're dealing with a real life data science project, it doesn't really look like your Kaggle data set or like your nicely cleaned up like, like bootcamp problems. Because in the real world, the a, 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 bit, a major bottleneck in a data science project is the lack of data, which uh, if you have lack of data, you don't need to think about how to process the data. But usually it will be the problem of poor quality data. So if you have poor quality data, that means that you need to put in more effort into your data processing. Uh, so uh, some examples will be that you have noisy images, noisy text, uh, like missing values. So all this, all these problems will require like data processing. Um, and that goes to the very famous 80-20 data science dilemma. So what is the 80-20 data science dilemma? So what it says is that 80% of the time is actually spent trying to acquire the data and clean the data. And only 20% of the time it's actually spent developing the models. So if we think that 80-20, it seems pretty reasonable, right? Um, I have to burst your bubble because in reality, it's closer to 90-10. And, it, and it's going to, the problem is going to get even worse when you have even more data. So, um, in terms of, like, so in terms of what sort of data processing do we use in Python, like in data science? First, in data science, Python is the common language that most of most data scientists use. And inevitably, right, we will run into problems whereby we will have to iterate an operation over like a, 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 over a list. So 
an example will be that, okay, let's say I want to perform the square operation on a bunch of numbers. So if we take, so the first thing that we learn is that we use for loops in Python. And then um, how do we conduct that? Okay, we initialize an empty list. And then after, and then we use the for loop and then we append the value to the list. But as mentioned by our previous speaker, for loops are actually a bad idea. Why is that so? It's because for loops are actually run on the interpreter and it's not compiled. And if we compare the performance of for loops in Python, you'll see it's terribly slow, at least like I think one to hundred times slower, which is quite disastrous. So yeah. So for loops are bad, so why not list comprehensions? Now, list comprehensions are slightly faster than for loops because, because the list comprehensions are optimized for use for, in, for interpretation on the Python interpreter such that when the Python interpreter sees the list comprehensions, it will be able to identify the repetitive patterns in the list comprehension and hence there is no need to call the append function at each iteration. So this is in contrast to for loops in Python, whereby when it's, whereby for each iteration, it will have to see that there's an append function, and then it calls the append function from the list, from the from the list. So list comprehensions are slightly better than for loops, but it may not be enough. And now we go to pandas. So I think the previous speaker have talked a lot about pandas and the performance optimization. Because pandas has because pandas is designed and to be optimized for in-memory analytics using data frames. So, yes, so because of its like elegance and ease of use, it is very popular among data scientists. However, when we look at large data sets, that is where we run into performance and out of memory issues. So what I mean by large data sets would be that data that is at least more than one gigabyte. So, so if I so if I run on like a sufficiently large data set that is like less than one gigabyte, it's great. Pandas is great. But if you're looking at like hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes, then that's not a good idea. Then it comes to the next problem. Why not just use a Spark cluster? Because it's a big data, right? Big data. Like it's large, like if my data is very big, then just throw it into the Spark cluster. But mm, well, there is always a price to pay for such tools. Because when you are when you suggest using a Spark cluster, there will be a communication overhead. So what do I mean by communication overhead? Because in a Spark cluster, you're leveraging on distributed computing. So in distributed computing, you are co the, your, com your, net, your, com your computes are actually communicating between independent machines in a network. So let me give you an example of how communication overheads looks like. Let's say uh, I have a phone. I have a phone. And then I WhatsApp you. I WhatsApp you. So I'm in Singapore right now. I WhatsApp you a message. And then, and then the message has to go through a network. And then it has to transmit to your network and get to your phone. So this is what I call communication overhead. Whereby your phone is a machine and you have to go through the mobile network. And secondly, is the problem of like small big data. So what's the definition of big data? Big data is not just about data that is too big to fit in memory. It is also about how diverse, how diverse the data set is. So you have like five or five Bs. One is the volume, one is the volume, another one is the variety. So even if your data is too big to fit in memory, it has large volume, but it may not have a lot of variety. And it may also not be large enough to justify using a Spark cluster. So if you want, okay, so this particular term is, like, if you want to find out more about this particular term, 
you can watch uh, Itama, Itama's talk on small big data at PyCon 2020. Yeah, so I will not elaborate so much into that. Um, so now, right, I, I, now I say that these computations are not, got, not good enough. Pandas is not good enough. I don't have data that is big enough for a Spark cluster. So that leaves me with parallel processing. So what exactly is parallel processing? Um, so I guess I don't like to look at definitions. So let's imagine that I work at a cafe which sells toast. Yeah, uh, it's like, okay, so I'm from Singapore and a traditional Singaporean breakfast consists of coffee, toast, and egg. Today, I should not talk about the egg, but we will focus on the coffee and the toast. The task one, I like to toast 100 slices of bread. So some assumptions that I make is that one, I am using a single slice toaster. Two, each slice of toast takes two minutes to make. And three, uh, this is a major assumption that there is no overhead time. But in reality, there will always be overhead time. So keep that in mind. Um, so what we are used to is sequential processing, whereby we do things in sequence. So if I have 100 slices of bread, I feed them one by one into the toaster, which in this case is a processor. And then after this whole process, I will get 100 slices of toast. But this whole execution time is going to take me 200 minutes. And yeah, imagine that you have you have only gotten 100 slices of toast in 200 minutes. And you and imagine that you are in a, like a, in a cafe whereby in Singapore, whereby people are very impatient. And then you and then you have a lot of customers. So you're not going to be able to serve your customers in time. But if you think about parallel processing, same thing. We have 100 slices of bread. We split them into four portions. We feed them into four processors, which is like toasters. And then after that, I get four batches of toast. So the task is actually executed into a pool of four. Okay. It's, it's executed in a pool of four toaster sub-processors. So each toasting sub-process, they run in parallel and independently from, e independently from each other, which means that even if one toaster is out of order, it's not going to affect how the other toasters are working. And then after that, I consolidate the batches of toast into one whole stack of 100 toasts. So what this means is that the output of each toasting process is consolidated and returned as an overall output. And I don't really care about the order of my toast, so it may not be in order. And this whole process is going to take around 15 minutes and the speed up compared with sequential processing will be around four times. So four toasters with a speed up of four times. Sounds great. Then next, I will go through right, what's the concept of asynchronous execution versus synchronous. So what do I mean by asynchronous? So let me give, let me give you another example. So, um, so let's go back to the example of a traditional Singaporean breakfast. Now we have, we have the toast ready. Now we need to brew the coffee. So same thing, some assumptions here. First thing, I can do other stuff while making coffee. So it means I, I, just, I just make the coffee and then go and make my toast or something. Second assumption, one coffee maker to wait one cup of coffee. Because sometimes you have to do it manually that one person can make one cup of coffee. So the assumption is that the, each cup of coffee takes five minutes to make. If, um, 
typically, and when we talk about synchronous execution, what it means is that first I brew a cup of coffee on the coffee machine, and then I just stand there and wait for five minutes. After my coffee is done, then I toast my two slices of bread or single slice toast after task two is complete. So this is two times two equals to four minutes. And then I, the total execution time will take, a, take nine minutes. So which implies that if I want to make 100 times of this, I will take 900 minutes to make 200 toasts and 100 coffee. So, it, so if we're looking at a cafe, right, that will be 100 sets for 900 minutes. And 900 minutes, it's going to be like 15 hours. I think by that time, I will be out of business. But if we look at the asynchronous way of execution, it, how I will do it is that while I brew the coffee, which I know that it's going to take five minutes, I will make some toast, which takes two minutes each time. And, uh, and if I do this process asynchronously, I'm going to take five minutes for the same type of output. So, uh, so effectively, your execution time is being cut by almost half. So it looks good, right? Like, hey, um, here, if I buy like, if I buy four toasters, I get four times speed up. If I do asynchronous, I can do more things at a time. So this, go, so this goes to the question of when is it a good idea to go for parallelism? Or to phrase it in another way, is it a good idea to simply buy a 256 core processor and just parallelize all your codes? Well, it's not that good an idea if you consider some practical considerations. One, is your code already optimized? Because well, sometimes all you need to do is to rethink your approach. For example, if your code is slow because you are using for loops in your processing codes, you might want to consider converting your for loops into list comprehensions or map functions for array iterations. Secondly, it could, secondly, we need to consider the problem architecture because the nature of the problem limits how successful the parallelization can be. Um, so if so, okay, let's say we have uh, some prop, there are some computational problems which are embarrassingly parallel, which means that it's very easy to parallelize everything. But if your problem consists of processes which depend on each other's outputs, or intermediate results, then it's not a good idea. So, okay, um, but okay, data dependency means that like I have a function, and then I have an input, and then I have output, and then a second function. Because the second function depends on the output of the first function. So if it is if there's some if there's some dependency. Between the out between the between these processes, then you might not want to be able to parallelize that. Or it could be that like, it could be that I have one task and another task, and then one task is doing like coming up with some intermediate, intermediate output, and then the other process is going to take the intermediate output. Then you can't really just parallelize your code that way. And last but not least, there is no free lunch in this world. I repeat, there's no free lunch in this world because there will always be parts of the work that cannot be parallelized. So this is summed up in MDOS law, which I will, I will go through in more detail. Secondly, there's also extra time required for coding and debugging parallel, parallelized codes versus sequential code. Because I have to refactor my code, I have to arrange it in a way whereby I can do the parallelization. So this adds on to increased complexity, increased complexity. And on top of that, there is also the problem of system overhead, including communication overhead. So if you thought, so even though, hmm, hmm, okay, so, okay. Uh, so, okay, sure. 
Okay, so uh, Engels law states that the theoretical speed up is defined by the fraction of code that can be parallelized. So it looks all good, but let's just look at what look at the outcome. If there are no parallel parts, you have no speed up. If you have all parts parallel, you have a lot, you have it, you have like infinite speed up. But your steep speed up is limited by the fraction of a work that is not parallelizable. Because there will always be like the initialization whereby you can't parallelize the initial initialization. So this is going to limit how much you can parallelize your workflow. So it will not so your it will not improve even if with infinite number of processes. Now let's go into the let's go into what's the difference between multi-processing and multi-threading. So multi-processing allows multiple processes at the same time using multiple processes. Multi-threading means that the system executes multiple threads of sub processes at the same time within a single processor. So the difference is between multiple processors and single processor. And for multi-processing, it is better for processing large volumes of data. But for, well, for multi-threading, well, multi it is best suited for I.O. or blocking operations. And I will talk more about that using some examples. But before we talk about, before we implement the code, there are some considerations. First one, because data processing tends to be more compute intensive. So switching between threads become increasingly efficient. On top of that, there is also the global interpreter lock that does not allow parallel track execution. So how do we do in this case? How do we do, how do we do a parallel asynchronous in Python without using any third, li third party libraries? So it turns out that in Python 3.2, there is already this module called, called current.futures, which is a high level API for launching asynchronous parallel tasks. And, it's, and it, is a, it is an extraction layer over the multiprocessing module. And there are two modes of execution. One is the track full executor for async multi-threading. Second one is the process full executor for async multiprocessing. And if we look at the Python standard library documentation, it explains about how, how the executors work by separating, separating like those chunks, separating the tasks into like the separating stuff like the iterables into chunks. So you can read more in, like, in the documentation. So, like, so if we look at like multiprocessing and multi-threading, right? Okay. So for the multiprocessing executor, it uses the multiprocessing module and sidesteps the GIL. But for the thread pool executor, because it is still subject to the GIL, so it is not truly concurrent, even though concurrent futures is has the word concurrent. So you need to consider that. And there are two, and then there's the submit operation, the submit function, which takes the function and, and the input arguments for that function and returns the futures object that re represents the execution of the function. And then map is similar, executor.map is quite similar to the built-in function map, whereby you return an iterator that yields the result of the function being applied to every element of the list. So, okay, so this is where I show you some examples of how we use the concurrent features module. So first case, it's about trying about getting data from an API. So uh, I use so I use the data dot sg real time weather readings and uh, the response is in the JSON format. So first I initialize the module, and then I initialize the API request task. In this case, in, so in this example, I use the trading module to monitor the thread execution. Initialize the submission list. And then I, okay, so first I try to use list comprehension. And it takes me about 16.3 minutes to be able to process uh, a, certain amount, a certain number of dates. When I use thread pool executor, it, it, the speed up is about 20.9 times compared with using list comprehensions. So I, just, just like I mentioned that list comprehension is the most optimized way of iterating without using parallel processing. So this speed up is quite significant when you compare to just compare it to using list comprehensions. And now the second case is whereby we are we are, we are doing some image processing. So um, I use the chest X-ray with the images, and the, and the reason why I need to do the, do the data processing is because the images in the data set are of different dimensions. So I need to standardize size sizes. So same thing, I initialize the Python modules. I initialize the image resize process. In this example, I'm using os.getpid to monitor the process execution. And I initialize the file list in directory. 
So in this data, in, so in this example, I am processing 1,431 images. If I use the map function, I get, uh, so it will take me about 29.48 seconds. If I use the list comprehension, it is slightly better in that it is well, slightly better but quite like not much difference. It's about 29.71 seconds. But if I use the process pool executor, if I use the process pool executor to get the, to process my images using eight calls, I get a speed up of about 4.3. So effectively by process, I take about seven seconds to process 1,400 images. So that's also that's all that is the power of leveraging on processful executor for, for your parallel processing. And if you take a closer look at the code, you can realize that the code is actually pretty simple to implement. Like, right. yeah. So some key takeaways that I'd like you to I'd like you to remember from this my talk is that not all processes should be parallelized because parallel processes come with overheads. There is no free lunch in this world because of MDAL's law. And you need to consider system overhead, including communication overhead. This is not just a problem of distributed computing. This also exists in parallel par parallelization, even though the communication overhead is not that significant. And last but not least, if the cost of rewriting your code for parallelization outweighs the time savings from parallelizing your code, this usually happens when your data set is not, not big enough. Please consider other ways of optimizing your codes instead. And yeah. And if you can't understand everything else that I said, just remember, please do not use your for loops. Please either use list compilations or if that doesn't work, Use concurrent dot futures module for your parallelization. Yeah, so there are some references, and yeah, reach out to me at all these social 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 media platforms, and you can check out my slides at this link at this GitHub repo. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shinri. That was very good. So uh, we don't have any questions other than the comment that uh, the attendees love toast too. <laughs> so <laughs> actually, good, good, good thing that we had lunch before, so because otherwise we would have gotten really hung hungry. Oh, so yes, thank you very much again. Yeah. And um, oh, there's one question there. What, why do you not use third-party packages like multiprocessing? Okay. Uh, first, Just I very need... quick. So. Okay, first I need to emphasize that multiprocessing is not a third party library. In fact, multiprocessing is part of the Python standard library. And concurrent of futures is an abstraction layer over the multiprocessing module in Python standard library. And for this at this particular use case is whereby uh, whereby I just want to process my data. It's not about trying to implement my machine learning algorithms like scikit learn because it's because if you are trying because you're trying to if you are trying to parallelize your machine learning training your machine learning model training process all this third but all these third party libraries like scikit learn tensorflow pytorch they also they have the implement they have their parallel implementation whereby you you, you whereby what you need to do is to set some settings on end jobs and like they will have, they will have some parallel implementation. But but this, but then if I'm in the case whereby I just want to be able to do some processing that is not involving the model training process. I wanna I wanna do the pre-processing that that goes before the model training. Or and and okay. let's say like in the case so of images, yeah. Right. Images is not really very clear cut. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for the talk. Uh, let me get your, your applause like this. Mm -hmm.